Coronavirus in India increasing by the day. The centre and state governments are doubling down on measures to curb the spread of the flu-like disease. Worldwide, the disease has claimed over 6,500 lives and has infected at least 1 lakh people. With the World Health Organization characterizing the spread of COVID-19 as a pandemic, one of the measures being recommended by the health and governance authorities across the world is social distancing, which is reduce the frequency of large gatherings and limiting the scope of in-person interactions. Social distancing is a method prescribed to check the spread of the COVID-19 so that the healthcare system is equipped to treat existing patients. Around the world, including in several Indian cities, governments have recommended that companies should allow employees to work from home and schools and universities have been shut for a period of a few weeks. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will discuss how to save or rather how to be safe from coronavirus. Joining me on the program today are Rajib Das Gupta, Professor, Community Health and Social Sciences, GNU. Jagdish Sadiza, Senior Clinical Psychologist, Institute of Human Behavior and Allied Sciences. Kavita Narayan, Technical Advisor, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And Meera Durai, uh, Duri, I beg your pardon, Deputy Director, NCDC. All right, thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Kavita Narayan, I'd like to begin the program with you. Let's first uh, understand, you know, from you, what is the current status as far as COVID-19 in the country is concerned? Great. Thanks, Frank, for that very vital question. And um, as I'm sure I think several are aware, um, I have a prior life, by the way, as uh, being trained from, from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Authority in the U.S., where, you know, I have sort of done this also responded to, uh, to disaster Katrina, the Hurricane Katrina, which came in. And I have to tell you that this time, the kind of preparation that we have seen with the government of India, not just at the federal level, but also with all the states, has been exemplary for a few reasons. And I think the key for that is really basically intersectoral, what I call coordination and communication, and what we call preemptive planning. So, you know, for any disaster, mitigation, containment and mitigation are the two important things we talk about in any of any such uh, disaster. And I think very early on, the moment the first cases started coming out of China, literally from January 8th onwards, uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, obviously with the, with the leadership of the Honorable Minister, all of the groups of ministers, not just from health, but from across sectors, started convening, talking and planning. And I think that is a critical step in terms of, you know, dealing with any disaster. So if you ask me today, we are already two months in, in terms of, you know, it's not like we woke up today and said what's happening. It has been a series of responses, which is dynamic, which is live, and that should be the nature of any disaster. Most important, what I would call is the almost uh, every day, uh, every day, every hour, almost, you know, communication, coordination, measuring what's happening, and uh, you know, ensuring that we are responding at that point. That's very important to us because you can't wait for a day. You know, you'll, you'll sleep in the night with the figure. In the next two hours, you'll see you know, something big happening in some way. So you need to have the system to be able to respond to that kind of dynamic uh, issues. And that's what I think we've done very well. And it's primarily happened because of obviously extremely good measures at the, at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare at the central level, but through the state surveillance mechanisms that have been set up in all the states. And through this, you know, uh, almost like I would say, constant coordination that's happening, it's been an and plus with, uh, with with coordination with the Ministry of External Affairs, you know, commerce, whether it's shipping, aviation, the borders, all of the work that we've been doing to sort of you know curtail, you know, ensure that the people that are coming in are being quarantined, people that are coming in from certain you know certain countries, we are ensuring that you know we are we are restricting travel to a set of countries. And most importantly, the communication. If you look at the ministry website, at any point you will find that we are we are constantly communicating the, the real status. So it's a it's an issue of sort of you know ensuring that there's no panic by open communication and by a close coordination mechanism. So that's really where I would say is the strength of the preparation so far. So in terms of the status, we are obviously if you look at our numbers, we are literally at about you know 110, 111 right now, which is still from what we know of the confirmed cases. Compared to the rest of the world, we are obviously not panicking yet, but okay. we are in preparatory mode. Okay, all right. I'll come back to, you know, why so many cases in Maharashtra and also getting into phase three and phase four that people are sure. talking about around the world. But before that, let me get in the other panelists as well. Uh, so, Meera Duria, as far as coronavirus, uh, you know, the latest version, COVID-19, the disease that it causes, there's very little information really worldwide if you look at it, uh, you know, that is available right now. Does that specifically pose a problem? How much do we know about this? See, uh, it is a type of a zoonotic virus which is enveloped. We know 
that initially it was found in it was reported from Wuhan China and the things kept on evolving uh, on 7th of January China shared the uh, genetic sequence of the virus with the other countries with WHO and then the testing facilities became available so before that the coronavirus is a group of viruses which have been causing diseases but mostly it does it uh, like not as a pandemic but as sporadic cases of MERS COV as we have seen and SARS earlier in 2003. But what we can say about it is that initially we did not know what is the mode of transmission, what is the whether asymptomatic they spread the disease or not and what is the clinical management required, what will be the level of immunity once a person is infected. So the situation kept on evolving and finally we got into, we got to know what is the incubation period like it is uh, we can say from 2 to 14 days and there were some cases of asymptomatic carriers being reported but then it was that they were suffering from mild symptoms. So basically uh, the contact tracing is one thing which becomes important when we talk of the containment strategy. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll, a follow-up question there. You know, as far as uh, this COVID-19 is concerned, there are many in the age group of about teenagers to about 50s who's, who, are, who probably believe that they are not going to get it. Is that the case? See, it affects all ages, all age groups. Uh, but we have seen that the children have not been much involved. And if we talk of elderly, elderly with comorbidities like hypertension, renal failure or diabetes mellitus or asthmatics, the mortality has been high for them. But otherwise, uh, no age group is one which has been left out or not affected by COVID-19 disease. And there have been reports of even newborn babies being infected, six months old being infected. So uh, we can't say that it's only one age group which is affected. But the survival rate is higher. Yes. Okay. All right. Taking the discussion forward, uh, you know, as far as uh, this particular disease is concerned, uh, Rajiv Das Gupta, you know, uh, thankfully there has not been a community level spread as far as this is concerned. Uh, is there a particular reason for that? That's the limited evidence till now. Uh, a lot of it is incumbent upon how fast we scale up the testing which the ICMR is doing. Uh, the ICMR which is the nodal agency for the lab diagnosis among other things uh, has now initiated uh, community level testing uh, and these results are going to be available in a week or so. That's a very crucial piece of evidence that's going to come. The second issue of course is currently the government strategy is to prioritize tests to international travelers and their contacts uh, but the story could be a little more different if a whole lot of symptomatics are actually tested. We also need to recognize that symptoms are relatively non-specific. It is a flu-like illness. Uh, in this country, we do not actually test for all flus. So the case definition here is slightly different from, let's say, a country like the US or some other countries. And therefore, it's a little early. Uh, however, uh, the emerging evidence is that it is across all states. It's moved from what was early, earlier thought to be something that would be largely confined at least in the initial stages to the metros. That's not the case because migrant streams are, uh, are there all across the country. Plus the fact that a lot of so-called uh, travelers who arrive from uh, foreign countries are actually moving into small towns and hinterlands. Therefore, the picture, as I believe, would emerge as not so much of the country as a whole, but perhaps town by town, district by district, and it would actually be a different kind of analysis than we are looking at it uh, as we are looking at it now at the national level. Absolutely. All right. So, Jagdish Sadiza, let's talk about another issue now. You know, the government has been appealing to the people. We have the caller to tones coming on the phone, you know, talking about and spreading awareness really as far as COVID-19 is concerned. But more specifically, there are people who have been isolated, who have been running away from isolation, you know, traveling back home. There was this classic case of a woman from Bangalore coming to Delhi first and then going to Agra, then being detained there, thankfully, by the authorities. So what do you do uh, in a situation like that? Yeah, very obvious because uh, 
in such kind of situations when they are um, isolated at home, they feel very loneliness. And sometimes they feel why this is with me and why my, my family members and what should I do? Such kind of anticipatory anxiety, what would be in the future and catastrophic thought that increase uh, their uh, helplessness. And because of helplessness, they are unable to perform what uh, uh, they are unable to perform their full potentials in their self resilience at home. They are much more worried about the future rather than the current situations. Current situations is to, um, um, I mean, uh, to um, overcome the uh, current scenario of this uh, COVID-19, considering, uh, not considering those things, but they are much more thinking about how, how long I will be isolated and how I can go for my productive uh, involvement, not only me and my family members also. These thoughts are very much uh, make them, uh, I mean, anxious about. Okay. So, so in such kind of situations, they must go for particular thought what they can do more at home. This is not the situations when you are at home, you cannot show your productivity. You can show, but in other kind of activities, you involve with the children you, um, in the different kind of activities. <clears throat> I mean, reading books and uh, some productive activities, uh, imparting some education, moral educations or some uh, creative activities, they can involve in that way. But other than the loneliness, feeling of loneliness, feeling of isolation and why it is with me, such kind of thought disturbs a lot to them. Okay, all right. Taking the discussion forward now, Kavita Narayan. Sure. Uh, why is it that Maharashtra is so badly affected as a result of COVID-19? You've seen the rapid increase in the number of cases in that particular state. And let's talk about or rather bust a few myths surrounding COVID-19. Um, let, me, let me start again by saying, you know, I think we'll, we'll take sort of how this disease progresses, right? And I think your topic today being social distancing, it's important to understand that in most of these, um, you know, in case of most of these viruses, we are dealing in particular with a virus. And I'm sure, uh, you know, my colleague here will obviously, you know, she's probably most, more of the expert on it. We're dealing with something that we don't really understand. You know, there is, in 1918, there was this big pandemic, you know, there was the, the flu, killed millions of people, etc. Things that have already happened, we've studied, we know a lot about. Let's be very clear that here is something where it's like, you know, we're playing treasure hunt. The whole world is playing treasure hunt to find a not very happy treasure. It's not like we're getting something, but it's like the pieces of the puzzle are coming in from everywhere. As Dr. Das Gupta just pointed out, once we know, you know, what the, once the test results are back, which we're obviously awaiting, once we get more, uh, you know, uh, answers from there, a lot of these will come together. For example, one of the questions we were discussing today is what is the effect of temperature? What's the effect of humidity on the virus? We still don't exactly know because if you look at the map, Argentina, you know, a place like Antarctica, which is super cold, there is not, you know, there are hardly any cases there. Yet there are other cold parts of the world where there is, you know, there's this, this thought that at the certain degree of temperature, this virus is not going to exist. So people have said, India, oh, hot place, it's not going to be there. These are all myths because we don't really know enough, you know, as, as the epidemiologists and everybody is trying. And as the pictures, thanks to social media in a way, as the pictures are emerging and people are sharing, we're all trying to understand. But it definitely seems like there are very different patterns in different parts of the world. So I think that's something we have to. So if you ask me why Maharashtra is certain like that, I, I don't know that we really have the answer yet. There's too little information. Too little right information now. to sort of comment on it. However, if you look at a crowded population, for example, this is exactly why, again, you know, the point of saying, could that be one of the reasons, though there is no real evidence to say, you know, this is exactly what will, you know, what should be done. But if there are a lot of populations, if there's a lot of crowding, for example, in a certain place, there definitely is a threat, right? Because you're, it is just with even the common cold, with, with anything. Now, because it's also the season where there's a common cold, there's also some flu, there's something else, all of which have very, very common symptoms. Then you have this, you know, sort of this, this idea where is everybody now is talking about because it's what it's the sort of, you know, the disease in mind. So there are also these issues and these fears because of not understanding exactly what the symptoms are. Absolutely. So I think the, the most important thing for us as a community, and I think really for me, my message here today is very clear, is an appeal to not just our viewers, to, to the people of the entire country to be very clear and simplify. You know, we, the most simplest thing we can do to spread disease is ensure that because this lives on surfaces, we continue to wash our hands. I think the information has gone out everywhere. You know, when you have symptoms, ensure that you are calling one of the, you know, when you think that there is something. First of all, the first point is let's not go and put ourselves, you know, in, in a society, in a, in a situation where there are hundreds of people. That's obviously important and very logical. 
please contact the helpline because there are. We will ensure that only those people are tested. There is no point in doing a random, you know, panic testing of the whole population. That's not going to be useful either. So some of these myths about saying that, you know, oh, I have a corona because I have two coughs. That those are some of the panic that is being created because of overuse of social media forwards. The first forward I get, you know, people are sending it out. So these are the things where the common public can actually help the efforts, the 24-7 efforts that are happening by the state governments and the central government and all of the, you know, authorities in sort of ensuring that wrong information is not, is misinformation is not spread and by simple things like social distancing and by, by things like hand washing. These are the simplest ways and most of all when you don't know enough about it, please don't end up being a public health expert because I can tell you that every single person in our country right now is an expert and therefore you know they're all spreading stuff. So I would say definitely let's not try Five and Five people, six opinions, yeah. so, you know, that's something that we should avoid and yeah. also get your news or get your information from trusted sources yeah. is what the panelists are suggesting so please keep that in mind, don't be uh, taken in or pulled in or sucked into information that you get on social media. Taking the discussion forward, why is it important, Neera Duria, to ensure that uh, you know we observe social distancing as far as COVID-19 is concerned? Okay. So when we talk of the disease clinical picture or the transmission of the disease or the spread of the disease, the spread or the mode of transmission is that when a person who is sick he coughs or sneezes and the virus it lands upon the nose or mouth of a, another person who is in close contact with him let's say within six feet or two meters of distance or either that it lands on the surfaces and another person who's healthy touches the surface and then he touches his face mouth nose eyes and then it gets into the body so that's the way it spreads so the thing, the idea behind social distancing is that we separate out the healthy people from the sick or the diseased. And in this way, we will be able to contain the disease. It's very important or pertinent for everyone to understand that once a person is sick, he should himself self-isolate, as my colleague has already suggested, so that he does not mingle with the healthy population and the spread of disease becomes easier. As we, uh, if we talk in epidemiological terms, it means there is a factor which is known as R, R0 factor or the transmissibility of the disease. It is equivalent to around 2.5. It means that one person can infect 2.5 persons and let's say it keeps on multiplying that another second person will infect 2.5 next and to those people who are coming in contact or if they get infection they will further keep on spreading the disease so the disease will grow exponentially if it is a contagious disease like COVID-19 so in this case how can we prevent the disease the disease can be prevented if we segregate the people and it will help us buy time as ma'am has already said it will help us buy time in the meanwhile our health system gets ready or already prepared india has been working since it was reported you know on 3rd of january we got uh, information from promed mail that there has been an outbreak of unknown viral pneumonia and at ncdc we have the ihr secretariat so through that mechanism of ihr reporting we Asked WHO regarding what is the disease going on there and mm. you know at NCDC we held meetings on 4th of January, on 5th of January, 7th of January and finally we had the JMG on 17th of January and also 15th of January and finally the public health response was put into place. So it's pertinent that people follow social distancing measures and social distancing measures they are also aimed at individuals and at groups. Right. So, like we started with the containment strategy, you have been talking about there are four phases. So, first of all is that we can have imported cases. So, our containment measures were aimed at the airports. So, we started with the airport screening. So, that we do not have imported cases in the community. And also, the evacuees who came from Wuhan, they were kept at separate quarantine centers. Quarantine and isolation are also type of social distancing measures, but they are aimed at individuals. And when we talk of other social distancing measures like, you know, avoiding mass gatherings or not taking public transport, work from home, all these are measures which are at groups and, you know, cancelling mass gatherings or sport events. It has a lot of uh, impact on the community, you know, the economy, but still they are the measures which will help us contain the spread of the disease and also help the health system buy some time sure. so that we are ready. Okay. All right. So, uh... Pajib Das Gupta, let's talk about another aspect now. You know, this issue of uh, 
how prepared we are as far as the community level is concerned. And would you say that the next two weeks are extremely crucial? Not only is next two weeks crucial, perhaps four to six weeks is crucial. Mm. Uh, what we just heard from our colleagues in the government of India and its various arms uh, is the planning uh, which is at the top, which is coordinating with the states and so on. Now, since we are talking of social distancing, community processes, etc., what is very crucial is the extent to which local health authorities are able to engage and the trust which communities have on local health authorities. And that varies widely across states. That's relatively stronger in rural areas where you have a whole uh, complement of frontline health workers. It is extremely uneven in urban areas uh, because in, because relatively few are actually going to get into clinical care. A whole lot of it is actually community level organization, community level coordination and so on. And therefore, as Kavita spoke of intersectoral coordination, which is very relevant, but it's relevant at the initial stages when you are actually limited to airports, seaports, etc. Now the phase that we are talking of, which is actually the, a very tough phase over the next four to six weeks, it actually needs to move from intersectoral to what's called whole of government and whole of society engagements. And that's far easier said than done. Intersectoral is actually relatively uh, simpler, if I may. Absolutely. And now the challenge, therefore, is how do we take it to the next level of whole of government and whole of society? Uh, and we also need to remember that we are operating in democratic setups. Absolutely. Which we're, is, not, we're not China at the end of the which day. Is, so which is also a big global question and dilemma at this point, that to what extent can democracies or democracies like ours uh, actually be able to maintain social distancing in its various forms. Sure. All right. So, uh, Jagdi Sadiza, let's talk about another aspect. You know, you have universities which are shut, you have schools that are shut, you have children staying at home driving mothers up the wall, really. How do you deal with a situation like that? Uh, that's why I said that every individual uh, is having assets and they do not know their uh, latent assets are there. This is the time where they are uh, isolated and uh, not uh, going to universities and these activities they are not doing. They can uh, find out themselves, introspect themselves to come up with their assets latent uh, abilities one is that must more important second is that like i would like to say about agra family entire family was um, suffering with covid 19 and how they have subsided all these things just because in the normal activity they were involved at home and simultaneously they were trying to do that preventive aspects also whatever hand washing and all the skills whatever they needed for they have to learn at a home also to themselves and to the family members also. If you see that in any time, any uh, some crisis, disasters comes, uh, takes place. So what happened? That entire community or family involved in spiritual activity to increase their manobal. That is also very much essential for them. When they will be involved such kind of spiritual counseling or spiritual activities, so definitely uh, their anxiety, their feeling of uh, loneliness and insecurity that would be subsided. So in that way they have to involve and definitely with the one thought that time is uh, time will go off, sure. not will uh, be stay for a long time. So we have to involve in the natural normal activities at home. Okay, all right. Uh, I've got two minutes left on the program. I'll get two quick closing comments from both the ladies on the panel. Starting first with you, uh, Mira Duria. Uh, how prepared are we now going into the next big crucial stage in the next four to six weeks, as Dr. Das Gupta was pointing out? I think uh, my colleague has already explained the preparedness part of it. And uh, India started quite early in time. And hopefully, if people follow the instructions and if the intersectoral coordination is good and we are able to do with community engagement and good risk communication so that people are aware why the government is taking such measures because there is a lot of impact on people. So hopefully we will be able to sail through and you know during pandemic period it's like you build the ship as you sail through. Okay. So 
Okay, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. How closing comments from you, close the show for us, Kavita Narayan, with your concluding remarks. We are, I mean, an assurance to the communities and to the people of this country that everybody is doing, at, at the people who are at the helm and who are in the positions from, you know, either the technical or the administrative standpoints, both within the states and the central government are doing, working round the clock to ensure the safety of the people of this country, also those that are coming in, but it's time for the communities and for the people to really do their bit. It is going to be inconveniencing in a lot of time, but please let's work together because this is really a, pro is a problem that only all of us working together is going to help solve. So that's really our appeal. Okay, all right. On that note, then we call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that COVID-19 is a threat. The threat is upon us. But if we work together and work as a team and a unit, a cohesive unit, we can put an end to COVID-19 is what the panelists are suggesting. And that's what we need to aim for. And that's the way we need to move forward. With that, it's a wrap.